that you have given us healing for our bodies, prosperity for our lives, Amen. wisdom, Lord, to know the way to go, to be led by your spirit, Lord. Father, you have covered every single issue in our lives. If we would just look to you, we would find the answer for every situation and every circumstance, for you are the answer. You are the fulfillment of every prayer, of every desire, and of every need. And we give you all the thanks and the praise for it this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Glory to God. God bless you. you. may be seated. Thank you, Tim, as always. Great job. Appreciate it very much. Thank you, Suzanne and Peter and Tammy for leading us in worship. Appreciate it. And especially to all of you for sharing whatever the Lord has placed on your heart and uh, being willing to share your prayer requests and, uh, and what God is speaking to you as well. Praise the Lord. Amen. God is good. What a miserable week. I mean, we're up, right, and above the sod, so I guess that's a good thing. But, man, is it hot and miserable, and it's hard to get much accomplished outside when it's this way. So. Although I did get a couple of things done, but not much, <laughs> praise the Lord. You know, I've discovered a few things in life as time goes on. One of the things is I guess I've finally come to the realization that I'm not really a romantic. Can I get an amen? <laughs> praise the Lord. Because, you know, when I see, like, lovers' names carved in a tree, I don't think it's sweet. I just think it's surprising how many people take a knife to a date. <laughs> Speaking of romance, I accidentally gave uh, Sally a glue stick instead of chapstick. She hasn't spoken to me since. <laughs> You know what sits in a tree and goes, ah, an owl with a speech impediment. <laughs> I wanted to tell you this really good time travel joke, but you didn't like it. Okay. <laughs> I'm the only one that gets that joke. I thought I'd tell you a good time travel joke. But you didn't like it. Uh -huh. Time travel. Time. <laughs> All right, never mind. Praise the Lord. Once, you were right. Once, praise the Lord. I still think it's really good. I may try it again next week, see if it catches anybody that. Praise the Lord. Time travel. You didn't like it. Yeah. Right? Let's stop and have a moment of prayer here for everyone in the room that doesn't get this. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Okay, God is good. Let's start off here with Romans 1.17. I've got a lot of scriptures here kind of going into this uh, message that I feel like the Lord's laid on my heart. I was talking to Tim the other day, and we were kind of discussing some of these very things. And uh, it just uh, has been more and more uh, kind of ingrained in uh, my thinking in terms of how God is wanting to help us to understand these things. We talk about our identity and who we are in Christ and that, but there's a way that this thing plays out too. And, and I think sometimes we miss it. We've made it, even though we don't want to, we end up making it about religion instead of about the relationship. And, uh, and everything that I've heard this morning is kind of pointing us back to this. This is about us and God, about our understanding and our relationship with God and uh, that's the key to everything, really. So in Romans 1.17, he says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. So how is the righteousness of God revealed? From faith to faith. By faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So the only way we can be a, a uh, manifestation, if you will, of the righteousness of God is by faith. You can't do it by trying to be righteous. Anybody that's tried that found out that it doesn't work. We end up screwing up. So if you really believe you've been made righteous, that you are the righteousness of God in, in the earth, then you'll do righteous things. For example, you'll walk by faith and not by sight. Amen? We think righteous is, you know, I'm going to go out and do some really holy thing. No, it's just living by faith. It's believing what God has said. That's what makes you righteous. 
In other words, you, you'll walk by faith and not by your senses. Not by what you're experiencing, not by what you're seeing or hearing, and right? right? That's called faith, amen? So the sad truth is that a lot of what's taught in churches hasn't made us believers, it's made us unbelievers. Right. It's, it's, it's worked against our faith instead of building up our faith. It has diminished it, amen? Yes. Because sin consciousness is in all of us, yeah. amen? And, and because of that, we operate out of who we think we are. So a lot of the works that have followed us have, uh, haven't always been in faith, haven't always been in love, right? So in terms of like classic Pentecost or, or religion in general, have been more focused on naming our sin rather than ministering grace and edifying. Because the law shuts up faith. The more you hear about what you should do and shouldn't do and so on and so forth, the less faith you're going to be operating in. A lot of people think, well, you know, they're just talking about grace because it gives them an excuse or an alibi for doing whatever they want. That's not the case at all. The reason for grace is because God has done away with the law. He's fulfilled the law. And every time we go back to the law, it stops what grace is trying to produce. Amen. And that is faith, for one thing, which is going to produce everything else that God wants us to experience in our lives. So let, let's look at this in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 23. Hebrews 12, 23, Peter. To the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits, get this, to the spirits of just men made perfect. This has not been made perfect. It's, it's in the process of being made better, but it's never going to be perfect. What's been made perfect is my spirit. The moment I got born again, I was perfected in Christ. Amen. Yes. We talked about this some last week, but it's worth repeating. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. So he tells us, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now how in the world yeah. would anybody in their right mind think that that would be possible? It's possible because it's God is a spirit, and we were born again in the image of God. We were born spirit beings, amen, and our Father in heaven is perfect. What makes him perfect? Because God only operates by faith. Yeah. From the moment of creation, from anything he's ever done, it's always been by faith in his own words and what he says that it will come to pass. So we, if we're going to be perfect, we have to operate by faith. If we're going to play out the perfection that we are in, in the spirit, the only way we can do that and manifest that in the physical realm is by faith. Amen. 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 So, praise the Lord. Our perfection is not about never missing the mark in terms of losing your temper, which I did on the way to work because of some individual in front of me that wanted to drive 10 miles below the speed limit and stop for every turn. I'm thinking, does he think that little thing's going to flip over because he turns at five miles an hour? I mean, he almost coming to a stop. And I had a, I said a small prayer for him. Praise the Lord. And then we went on. Praise God. But you know how you can get just, you, things, you know, sometimes you get irritated. Yes. The older I get, the more irritable I get, I think, sometimes, you know. But I'm just saying, perfection isn't based on our ability to perform. It flows from God's sacrifice just like our righteousness does. Amen? Amen. Hebrews 10, verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices, talking about the animal sacrifices, which they offer year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So it, the law is never going to make you perfect. Religion will never perfect you. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Look at verses 9 and 10. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that's the law, the first covenant, that he may establish the second, which is grace or the new covenant. By the which will we are sanctified. By what? By the second. We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Right. Praise the Lord. So perfection won't come by keeping laws or rules or rituals. We've been sanctified by the offering of Jesus' body. Period. Yes. That one offering 
has perfected us forever. That, that's something to shout about if you're a Pentecostal, or even if you aren't. If you want to shout, that would be something to shout about. Praise the Lord. By His sacrifice of that body, I have been perfected forever in Him. Praise the Lord. I can't screw it up. I can't mess it up. All right, so let's look at this now. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 25. It may look like I'm going in 10 different directions, and I may be, but hopefully they'll all come back to some place that makes sense. Having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance of joy and joy of faith. Praise the Lord. Joy, right? Yeah. All right, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. All right? Joy. 1 Peter 1 and 8. Whom having not seen, you love. In whom though now you see him not, yet believing... You rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Joy. Praise the Lord. All right. Matthew chapter 6, 30 through 33. Matthew 6, verses 30 through 33. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today and, is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not so much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Praise the Lord. John 10, 10. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He says, but I came to give you abundant life or a complete life, a full life. Amen. Yes. I come that they might have it more abundantly. Praise the Lord. And then Romans 1, 17. And the just, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. How does God's righteousness get revealed? It has to be revealed in us. It's done from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Praise the Lord. So I'm, I'm thinking uh, we've, we've substituted a lot of things. What we talk about today when we talk about having fun or something, we call that happiness, right? We, we confuse all of these definitions of words. But happiness, instead of being uh, a self a selfish pursuit, uh, uh, just a selfish desire. The way a lot of Christians actually believe it, if they're happy, they must be doing something they shouldn't be doing, right? I mean, I, I've told the story before, but this is God's honest truth. Uh, pastor that pastored the church that we were uh, in for a number of years in, in Texas, the original pastor had retired. He was pastor emeritus. You know how they always do in that given some place. So he had already retired, but he was telling a story one time about uh, back in the 60s or whatever it was, and some of the young people from the church came to him and asked him if they could play putt-putt golf, miniature golf. Well, he'd never heard of it because he was a dyed-in-the-wool holiness preacher, you know. So he said, I told him no. He, said, he told us, he said, I didn't know what they were talking about. I just said no. And everybody kind of looking around. And he said, because I figured if they had to ask, it was probably something they shouldn't be doing. <laughs> Now, that's kind of the mindset. Now, he's a great guy, loved God, and, and did a lot of great stuff. But some of those things, you know, like you couldn't play sports and different things, intramural kind of things, or co-ed type of sport, uh, because of just the contact between men and women, and, you know, mixed bathing and all, all the other stuff that goes with it. And I'm not talking about taking a bath. I'm talking about swimming. But nevertheless, everything was bad. Everything was wrong. So we got to the point where you think, if I'm having fun, there's something yeah. probably not spiritual about it. There's something unright about yeah. this. If I'm enjoying it, you know, if I'm having a good time, it's probably sin. It's probably, it's probably a bad deal. So we never enjoyed really much of anything. Here's the point. We've diluted the meaning of happiness. 
to, uh, if you're looking at the old uh, ancient uh, philosophers and religious people like Aristotle and a lot of other ancients, ha happiness was a state of being. And they used the word the way we use the word joy. All right? This, this thinking was picked up by Christian scholars, Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, and later Blaise Pascal. They, they saw happiness rightly defined as one of the ends of human life. In other words, we were created to be happy. We were created not to be miserable and sad and depressed and bummed out and freaked out and scared and all that. We were created to have to be happy. Yes. Amen. And so they they all came to this conclusion that uh, they didn't see any tension between or contradiction between happiness and living for God. <laughs> what a revelation that you could live for God and actually be happy. Have fun. Enjoy life. And it would be good. Amen. So when Thomas Jefferson used the phrase, the pursuit of happiness in the Declaration of Independence, he, too, had in mind the classical sense of the word happiness. Amen. Jefferson saw true happiness as the full development of human potential and as a human right and a goal along with life and liberty. This is what, this is what he's, Jesus is talking about when he said, I came to give him life, not just Existence. I came to give them an abundant life, yes. a life that's fulfilling, yes. a life that satisfies, a life that, that shows you that, hey, I was here for a reason. Yes. I made the best of it. I got the most out of it. I did what was right. You know, I got the, the good stuff out of it. Amen. So it wasn't really until contemporary thinking that word, the, the word happiness became watered down to simply mean pleasure without regard to ethics or virtue or anything else. Just if you have fun. You're happy. Yeah. That's, that's not the way the word was intended to be used, amen, in the beginning. But this, this watering down explains why a lot of Christians today have a hard time thinking, that, um, thinking of, of, of happiness as something that can be connected to faith. Amen? Thinking that happiness could be connected to righteousness. Right? I mean, I bet you get around religious people, and they're... They get nervous if you're just laughing. If you're happy, they're thinking, what's he laughing at? What's he, what, is he, yeah. you laughing at me? Is, what, what's that all about? Yeah. I had a weird experience the other day. We went to a, uh, we tried a couple of different restaurants. It's getting to the point where it's almost cheaper to eat out than it is yeah. to try to fix a meal, especially when Sally's used to fixing it for 10 people at a time. And I don't like leftovers, so it makes it difficult. Anyway, we went to this little uh, Mediterranean place in Ankeny. And, uh, so we got some hummus and, you know, different gyros and whatever we had. And, but this guy, this older guy, he's, we were sitting, we went kind of back to one end of the restaurant and just a couple of doors from a couple of uh, tables, I should say, from the, from the back door, from the other door. Well, the bathroom was back in that area anyway. And so this guy gets up and he's walking like he's going back to the bathroom to go out the door and he's looking at me all the, all the way. He just keeps looking at me, and I'm thinking, wow, this is getting a little awkward. And he just keeps looking, but he's not smiling. It's not like a come on. He's just looking like, what is your problem, mister? You know, and I know what he's thinking. I know it's weird. I know it. But, hey, I hadn't had that feeling since 1968, <laughs> praise the Lord. And I thought, well, you should lose some weight, too. I mean, that's what I wanted to say. To, to, <laughs> I said it to Sally under my breath. Because I knew what he was thinking, you know, I'm, re I'm reading his mind. You old fool, you know, get a haircut and grow up, you know. And I'm thinking, well, you could lose some weight and we'd both be that happier, praise the Lord. <laughs> anyway, I'm just saying, some people are just not happy unless they're angry. I mean, they can't just enjoy things. They can't just have fun. They can't just relax. And, you know, there always has to be some crisis hanging around the corner, some, the next Shoe's going to fall. And yeah. I, I know I'm not the most focused when it comes to stuff like that, as Sally will tell you, because she's a little more narrowed in on what she wants to do and how she wants it done and so on and so forth. I just kind of just go at it and hope that everything turns out all right, praise the Lord. And she's wanting to tell me, you know, what days to mow and how high to mow it and which way to point the chute and should I have the bag on or shouldn't I have the bag on and I'm just thinking hey man let's just get this thing bowed. I just want to get it done I want it over I want out I'm, I'm, I'm finished with it praise the Lord uh, but I need this because otherwise the place would look a lot different than it does I can guarantee you that so. 
But anyway, why, why is it that we so often feel like our personal desires are in conflict with our holy desires? They don't have to be. We, we think they are because if I'm having fun, I must be doing something I shouldn't be doing. When most of the stuff that we're doing that's fun, it's not in here anyway. It's just like what Tim said. There, there, there's a lot of things that we call sin. We don't, they're not defined anywhere. It's just if it's not good for you, then probably don't do it. But if it isn't going to hurt you any, it's probably all right. Just don't mess somebody else up with it, you know. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So anyway, uh, Matthew 6.33, when he talks about uh, come, come to me. I know you have need of stuff. I know you've got stuff that you need. I know you need healing. I know you need financial help. I know you need this thing, and I know you need that thing. But seek first the kingdom of God. In other words, come into relationship with me, and this other stuff will get sorted out. It will. It'll get taken care of. But I've got to be the priority in your search here, not the stuff. It's not anything wrong with wanting the stuff. He knows that we have need of it, and he wants us to have it. But it's our way of going about trying to get it that gets us into issues a lot of times. So uh, look, look, look at 2 Peter 1 and 3. And uh, in, just like, in, again, in Matthew 6, 33, where he says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And the stuff, the things that you've got to have, it'll be given. It'll be taken care of, right? Whatever it is. So according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, or you could say righteousness, amen, and faith. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things, everything that pertains to life and godliness. That's your clothes. That's your food. That's your uh, marching band out front. It's whatever. <laughs> It's everything. It's, it's your finances. It's anything you might need. Yeah. Right? He's given it all to us. Through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. So everything we have, whether it's a quote-unquote spiritual or a physical need, it comes through the knowledge of him. It comes through us knowing him. Right. Praise the Lord. It doesn't come by us whining and begging and pleading and fasting and doing everything else. It comes from our knowledge of Him, our understanding of His grace and His goodness yes. and His desire to give us all yes. things that pertain to life yes. and godliness. Yes. Praise the Lord. And so, God's design for the unity of our desires or for the combination or collection of our desires is found in pursuing right relationship with Him. Amen? He wants us to have fun. He wants us to have all things that pertain to life and to godliness. But there's only way to, one way to get it, and that's through pursuit of Him. Yes. If you're trying to get the stuff without pursuing Him, you may get some stuff, but you'll still never be happy. Right. You'll just have more stuff and still be miserable. Right. Praise the Lord. All right, look at John uh, 15, 9 through 11. See, if we separate our desires from our actions or our desires from the way we live life. We become anemic. Our faith is dissipated. Right? Because then I gotta be schizophrenic. I can't be me and be spiritual. I gotta be spiritual and then when I wanna have fun, I'll be me. Yeah. Or when I got something else I have to do that's gonna occupy my time and my energy, then I gotta be Nathan again. No, that's, what he's saying is this is a, this is a one thing. Your happiness, your natural life, your spiritual life, your joy, they're all connected in the relationship that you have with God. It can't be any other way. That's why he's telling us, seek me first. This stuff is it's, it's no big deal. It'll happen. You'll get it. You'll, you'll be blessed. You'll have all of that. But you've got to get keep the, the horse in front of the cart. You've got to keep what's first first, what the priority has to be, the first thing. So as the Father hath loved me, he said, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. How, do we, how are we happy? How do we have abundant life? How do we have a full life? By remaining in him as he remains in God. Yeah. We're, we, we become one, right? Yeah. That's... Kingdom happiness. Yes. The reality is that our happiness 
God's glory and loving one another are all bound up together in faith. Yeah. Listen to me this morning. We, we read this stuff, but we don't pay that much attention. We don't make the connections. And we're out here working our right. rear ends off trying to be happy. Right. Trying to be pleasant. Mm -hmm. Only to fail because, oh, God's expecting me to do this. Or God's demanding this. Or, or the church wants this. And, and so on and so forth. Amen. But he's telling us our happiness, his glory, loving each other. They're all connected in how faith operates. Mm -hmm. So we just try to have faith. We go on a fast for 10 days and think that's going to, I'm going to have enough faith now to accomplish anything. Amen. Only to find out I'm just hungry. Yeah. Praise the Lord. I'm not against fasting. I've done it. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not saying that you shouldn't fast. I'm saying fast for the right reason. Yeah. You know, as you're led by the Lord. Praise the Lord. So without understanding how these things uh, correlate or come together, We've missed something important about faith. Mm -hmm. Living for God includes living for righteousness, and it's somehow tied up with our own happiness. I don't think you can be righteous and not be happy. We look at Jesus, and the way Jesus had been depicted to us mm -hmm. is like he was kind of like the way God was shown to us in the Old Testament by religion. Angry, a little frustrated, a little tired of people, kind of like a preacher. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm just saying, though, Jesus had a sense of humor. And if you don't see that, you're not reading the Bible. He, he was joking. He was teasing. He was using irony and, and sarcasm. I mean, he, he, I'm sure there were people around him laughing, and there were some that were probably pretty irritated because the joke was at their expense only because of, the, because of their attitudes and their behavior, you know? So I think Jesus was in good mood all the time. Yeah. I mean, a couple places there where things are pretty tense and in the garden and that. But otherwise, he's, he's, he's having a good time. He's enjoying life. He's, he's experiencing the fullness of it. He's, he's living it. He's living the good life, praise the Lord, and enjoying every minute of it. Look at, let's look at this now. And uh, in Matthew chapter 5, and we'll read verses 1 through 16, because he gives us here a picture of godly happiness. And I'll show you what I mean. All these things, he goes uh, in, in, in Matthew 5, it's the Beatitudes is what we're talking about here. The, seeing the, the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be fed. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now, you would read that and think, okay, well, that means we're just going to be miserable all of our life, and then when we get to heaven, it'll be all right. That is not what he's saying. He's telling us, you're going to find yourself in these situations, amen, where it doesn't look like you're being blessed at all. And he's saying, I'm telling you, if you'll believe, you're blessed right. even in the midst of all of this. Right. No matter what it is you're going through, right. amen. The word beatitudes actually comes from the Latin word beati, and that means power, or it means blessed or happy. And beati is translated... Uh, in the Greek word, from the Greek word makarios, amen, that was in the original version of Matthew when this was written. It was written in Greek, obviously. And that word it also meant happy, blessed, and even meant to be envied. He's saying, blessed. You're not just blessed. People will envy you because you're going to have something they can see, but they don't have. Right. It's going to get their attention. It's going to cause them, amen, to want what you have. Jesus said that while those who are meek, merciful, peacemakers, persecuted, they may not have pleasure in every single moment, right? But they are the ones who experience true happiness and blessings from God and are envied by the people who aren't and who don't. Right. Amen? So you're thinking, okay, so what? Well, we need to recover the full classical sense of the word happiness to be able to understand what it is God's trying to do in our lives. Mm -hmm. 
Praise the Lord. Because happiness is vital to how we understand faith. Now, I've seen some angry people who claim to have faith, but I'm telling you what, if you really have faith, you're going to be happy. You're going to be happy because you're going to be blessed. You're going to be experiencing the blessings of God. You're going to be experiencing the promises of God manifested in your life. So sour, down and out, and upset and aggravated people, you say what you want to, but I'm saying that's a, that's a little faith there. That's just small faith. Praise the Lord. Amen. Romans 15, 13. Now the God of hope, the God of hope, fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in the hope, in hope, through the power of the Holy Ghost. Praise the Lord. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope. Peace. In faith, in other words, is what he's saying. So that you can abound yes. in the expectation through the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Yes. Praise God. Amen. So happiness helps establish this intimate relationship with God. How many of you have people, acquaintances, maybe even friends that are always depressed, that are always bummed out, that always have a, uh, something negative. You know, it's always bad. It's always yeah. something. Man, you get so sick of it. It's just, pretty soon you want to just say, shut up. Just stop. Stop talking. Or else you just run like your hair is on fire because you don't want to listen anymore. You don't want to hear it because it gets to you. Yeah. It starts depressing you. Yeah. It starts affecting you. Amen. So happiness. Look, believe me, God... God isn't different in that respect. He still loves us when we come to Him. But if you come whining and complaining and depressed and bummed out, no, 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 what are you telling God? Why are you, I'm thinking God's probably saying, why are you telling me this? Because obviously you don't believe I can do anything about it or you wouldn't be complaining about it. Right. You'd be saying what I say about it. Right. Praise the Lord. Happiness actually is the current that helps carry us Along. And happiness has this strange, I don't know, maybe as, as weird as it might sound, it provides a natural and godly motivation for doing good. How many of you know when you feel good, when you're happy, you throw money in the pot? I mean, I go into cases and if I'm in a good mood and I'm getting something, I get changed back. There's always a can there. And I'm not saying it's not legitimate there's some little kid that's got an issue family can't take care of it or or there's march of dimes or there's uh, you know uh, olympics you know the the handicap and uh, you know if i'm in a good mood i'm looking to do something i want to do even if it's just 50 cents in the can or a dollar in the can or yeah. a few bucks here to somebody or whatever it is it's it, it's just a natural flow amen of being happy yes. happy people give happy people are fun to be around. Happy people are in, enjoyable. God wants happy people. Do you think He wants a bunch of whining complainers and worriers and freaking out people all the time? God isn't worrying. Just like Tim said multiple times, God is not up in heaven wringing His hands thinking, oh my God, what am I going to do about this? How in the world am I going to... Oh, i got to take some time and figure out how to make this thing work out for them because they look like they're in big trouble. No. He's already supplied every need that we have. He's already managed to take care of every possible yes. situation or circumstance that could come up. Uh, we ought to be happy. Yes. If we knew that, we'd be happy. Amen? So, 1 Timothy 6, 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Hmm. It's a novel thought too, isn't it? Godliness with contentment. Verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. This is eternal life, that you know God. Amen. And Jesus Christ whom he has sent. All right. 
So fight the good fight of faith. Why? So that I can have this. It takes faith to have this relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And that's where the joy of the Lord becomes my strength. That's where happiness begins to flood over me. Yes. That's where I begin to, you know, I've never been jealous or envious of somebody who's always depressed. I'm, I'm jealous and envious of that person who seems like they're so yes. dumb they're happy. Yes. You know, or you, know, you think they must be stupid because look at the crap that's going on around them, and yet they seem to be oblivious to it. They yeah. seem to just be happy that life's good and it's all yeah. good. That's the person I want to be like. That's the person I envy. Yes. I want to get up every morning thinking, wow, what's the Lord got in plan for today? You know, what, what's it going to be today? Instead of getting up and going, oh, my God, what's going to happen today? Yeah. You know, praise the Lord. Contentment is not the result of accumulating more and more stuff. Praise the Lord. True joy, real happiness, real contentment comes through spiritual strength and encouragement that transcends our lot in life and the sum total of our possessions. Any momentary situation I might find myself, true joy. Real happiness, real contentment comes from this spiritual strength that tells me no matter how bad it is, it's going to be all right. It's going yeah. to be better. It's going to be good. Yeah. God's going to work it out. I'm going through this, but the key is I'm going through. I'm not stuck here. I'm not staying here. I got some stuff that I got to deal with, but God's going to take care of it. I keep my relationship with God, the joy of the Lord, the knowing how much God loves me, how God is on my side, how God is for me, gives me the strength to deal with the moment so that God can manifest the thing that he's trying to do in my life. So that I can get all that he has for me yep. pertaining to life and to godliness. Yes. i got to stay happy. i got to keep the joy of the Lord. If I get depressed and all bummed out and go crawl off into the cave or go to back to bed and pull the covers over your head and just say, <laughs> just wait for a week, maybe something good will happen. No. no. you got to get up and live as the, that's called faith. Yes. Amen. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I'm going to live my life happy. I'm going to live as though everything in my life is perfect because it is if I will believe it. It will manifest as perfection if I will believe in the perfection of God. If I'll just stay joyous and happy, amen, even when it looks like all hell's going around me, I will not only be a witness for God and, and, and release the the glory of God in the earth, I will receive every promise that he's promised me. Because yeah. the only way I can get it is by consistent faith. Yeah. I can't believe it today and then go, well, God's left me and God's done me in and God doesn't care or I just screwed this up so bad now it won't ever get worked out. No, then i got to start the whole cycle all over again. I just need to stay. My faith needs to be, when I start getting depressed or bummed out, my faith needs to say, hey, smile. Come on, cheer up. God's with you. I mean, God is on your side. Why are you yes. bummed out? Let the idiots be bummed out that don't know God. Let them be freaked out. Let them go through the depression. Let them have the problem. And they can look at me and envy me. And then maybe I can give them something that they're struggling to, see, to receive, right. to experience. God, not religion. God. They, that's what they're after. They don't want more religion. They're freaked out by religion the same as we are. What they want is a God to be real to them. They want a relationship that causes them to think, Woo, life is good. Praise the Lord. It's going to get better. You can't attract uh, bees to cow manure. No, they're looking for honey. Praise the Lord. They're looking for pollen. They're looking for something sweet. And we're trying to get people to come to Jesus through some path, winding path of cow manure. <laughs> no crap. Just because they're having to deal with all the stench of religion to get to the beauty of Jesus, to get to the real truth of who, uh, of who God is and what he wants us to experience. Joy, happiness, have fun. Yes. Life is good. It is. I mean, it sounds almost, coming from a religious perspective, it sounds almost, uh, I don't know, uh, irrational. Yeah. Stupid. And yet, that's what God is saying. It's all wrapped up in your happiness, your joy, your strength, yes. your, your uh, endurance, your patience. It's all wrapped up in loving God and trusting God and being in the relationship with Him and not being fearful right. that He's going to let something happen to you that shouldn't happen to you. Right. Praise the Lord. Praise God. 
God wants us to have stuff. He wants us to be blessed. He wants us to have abundant life. But he doesn't want the stuff to be the priority. He wants that to be the residual effect of our relationship with him. He wants it just to flow out of my relationship with him. Amen? It's like, it's like a parent, you know, uh, grandparents, whatever. The kids ask for something. If I've got it, I'm going to give it to them. That's, that's not the deal. I mean, I, I'm happy to do it. It makes me feel good to be able to do it. But sometimes I like to just do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't want them to feel like, well, I had to go ask Dad again, or I had to ask Mom for this or that or whatever. Yeah. Sometimes I like to just do it and have them go, what's this all about? Yeah. You know? yeah. Mess with their sleep for a yeah. while, praise God. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just, just, and that's God. He, doesn't, he wants us to come to him if we have needs, but he wants us to understand, I'd rather just give it to you without you ever having to ask. I, I'd rather be able to do this so you don't ever feel guilty or feel uh, insecure or, or feel less, you know, diminish your value or any, in any way. God just wants us to know, look, I want to give you more than you can ask for. I just want you to trust me. I just want you to love me the way I love you. Amen? So, praise the Lord. There's a... Let's look at this again. Uh, Philippians 4, 11 through 13. Praise God. Philippians 4, 11 through 13. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Now that sounds good, but I... I expect all of us have been somewhere at some time or another when it wasn't that comfortable mm -hmm. or you didn't have what you really felt like you had to have in order just to survive. But nevertheless, Paul's learn, learning something here. He said, not that I speak in respect of want, for I've learned in whatsoever state I'm in therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased or how to be without, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Now, this is what got my attention. Paul said the source of his contentment was that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. My, my, I don't satisfy myself or don't try to finish myself by what I'm experiencing. In other words, whether that's what Paul's saying, whether I've got a whole bunch or I don't have anything. That's not going to determine my joy. That's not going to determine how I feel about life. Because I've discovered one thing. I can do anything. I can achieve anything. I can have anything through Christ who strengthens me. So if I keep the focus on my relationship with Jesus, with my relationship with God, the stuff will take care of itself no matter what it looks like today. Yeah. I may be a base today, yeah. but I know that I can abound tomorrow, and I'm not going to worry about it one way or another because as long as I keep the focus on Jesus, he's going to supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. This is seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. This is having all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of yes. him, through knowing him. Amen? So, God alone, only God, constitutes our happiness. Praise the Lord. We thought it was a lot of things. Romance, money, yeah. fame, prestige, power, whatever it might be. But look at the people with it yeah. that don't have God. Right. They're still blowing their brains out. They're still killing one another. They're still going nuts. They're still miserable. They're still unhappy. They're, why? Because the one common denominator with happiness and joy is the knowledge of God. That's right. The relationship with God. Then, when you get the things... Now, brother, they become blessings. They become something really special. Why? Because you've got the, the, the anchor that keeps, you, that keeps you fixed in life. That God is good. That it's going to be better. If it's bad today, it'll be better tomorrow. God's going to take care of it. He's promised. I'm, I love you, Lord. I know that you have my best interest at heart. I know you're not going to let me down. I'm hanging in here with you. I'm trusting you. You are my shield and exceeding great reward. And I know you're going to take care. And that, that keeps me going. That keeps me going. And then when uh, people are looking at you and they're thinking, I don't know, this guy, he's got some real issues, but he must be so screwed up he doesn't know that he has these issues. No, I'm just not bothered by it because I know 
that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, that he's going to supply my need if I'll just keep my focus on the relationship that I have with him. Amen? Yes. Praise the Lord. That's what he's after. Glory to God. God is most pleased with us when we are most satisfied with him. Yes. Praise the Lord. It's a, it's a two-way street. Look at James chapter 1, uh, verses 2 through 8. James 1, 2 through 8. I want to be happy. I, I've spent enough time in my life mad, upset, depressed, aggravated, frustrated, all of that stuff. I, I, don't, ha I don't have an time for it. I'm, I'm just saying, it's not that I don't have uh, compassion for other people or that I don't care about other people, but I just don't have time to be miserable. The time I've got, I want to spend happy. I want it to be joy, unspeakable, and full of glory. I want it to be something good. I, I've had enough of the struggles and, and trials and worries and fears and all of that kind of stuff. And I know I'm not going to get out of this life without more of that negative stuff coming at me. But I'm not, I, I refuse to live in it anymore. I refuse to just let it dominate my thinking and my life. I'm not going to be like that. God has promised me so much more. I'm going to trust in Him, amen, and He'll meet all my needs, whatever they might be. Praise the Lord. I'm not going to wring my hands and freak out about stuff. I'm just not going to be miserable. Life's too short. Praise the Lord. So my brethren, he said, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. This is exactly what we're talking about. The temptations are not necessarily some beautiful woman on the corner trying to get you to go home with her. The temptation might be to give in to sickness, to give in to fear, to give in to poverty, to give in to anything that's coming against you as a lie telling you something other than what God has said about you. Amen? So uh, when we fall into those temptations, and they're, they are diverse. They're diverse. Amen? There are all kinds of them. Because I may have some you've never dreamt of having, and you may have some that I couldn't imagine it even being a temptation or a problem, right? So that's what makes us unique. But knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Praise the Lord. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Now, how would patience do that? It forces me to trust God. Yes. Patience will cause me to put my confidence in the Lord and not in my circumstance and not in my situation. And eventually, that faith, that patience, amen, will perfect will be perfect and entire, and I'll be wanting nothing. It's the same thing he's telling us about seek first the kingdom of God, and all the other things will come. You'll be lacking nothing. Health, wholeness, finances, relationships, whatever, whatever it might be. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. That's the description of the church, for the most part. And it's a description of me many times in my life, too. But that's what I'm saying. That I don't want. Because it don't get you anything except more depressed. And cause more doubt. And I'm going to get to doubt in a little bit. But doubt, we think of doubt and we just give up. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I've dealt with over the years, and including myself to some degree, it happens, has happened, where they'll come and they've got something going on in their life. It's not good. It's a negative thing. It's whatever it might be. And then they just say, well, I guess, you know, God's just not interested in doing this for me. Or, or I've done something for some reason and God's not going to help me out. That's giving up. That's quitting. And that's exactly what he's talking about right here. You can't say, I'm going to believe God, and then say, I don't believe God. Or, I believe God, but God don't do this for me. You're not special. You're just like everybody else, and he loves you the same as he loves everyone else. He wants to do anything for you that you will believe him for, that you will trust him for. Amen? So a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Don't think that you're going to get anything because you're believing and you're not believing. You're praising and then you're accusing. Praise the Lord. Why didn't you fix this thing? Why haven't I gotten this done? Why hasn't this worked out? Why didn't that take place? Praise the Lord. We, we have struggles with this stuff, you know. So there's a tension to spiritual happiness. And it's the paradox that while our felt needs or our immediate needs, amen, and our fears, these are real. I'm not saying that they're made up. I'm just saying they're natural things. Amen. They're, they're, 
closely tied to what? To circumstances. Right? Our fears, right? Our, our, our happiness are tied to stuff. They're tied to our senses, to our circumstances. Praise the Lord. Happiness is somehow meant to transcend those needs, those fears. Amen? Those circumstances. Because, see, in the midst of bad circumstances, how is it that you consider your trials, your problems, your issues, pure joy? faith. Nice. This is where real faith comes in. Right. You know, Matthew 14 verses 28 through 31. You got to count it all joy. Yes. I mean, you have to you have to do it. You just have to start talking. Praise God, it's all good. It's going to be good. God's got an answer. He's working on this thing right now. If I don't deviate from the truth, if I don't move off of his word, I can re retain the joy of the Lord even in the midst of the problem. I, we've always, we always tie our, our fears and our anxieties and everything. They're always built up by the circumstance, by our senses. Yeah, Amen? That's the key to, to, to faith is that faith, you can be happy. You can have joy in the midst of all kinds of crap, but you can do it by faith. Yes. And that's what God's looking for. Yes. Praise the Lord. How many fewer ulcers and heart attacks and... And God only knows what other cancers and everything else that come from stress. I'm not saying all of them do, but I'm saying a lot of it comes from just being fearful and stressed out and, and trying to figure out how to get everything done for everybody. Amen. So Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it's you, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. And, okay, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and called him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? So just like Peter walking on the water, it's hard to keep our eyes on the source that sustains our faith. But it's easy to focus on the challenges or the obstacles to walking by faith. It's, it's easy. It's, it takes discipline. It's, it's effort to Focus on Jesus, on God, on our relationship. But it takes nothing at all to fall into fear of circumstances. Because it's all around you. You can see it. You can touch it. You can feel it. You're hearing about it all the time. So it's a constant driving uh, force. Amen. Biblical happiness can ground itself in faith. Praise the Lord. True happiness will ground itself in faith. In what God has promised. In spite of what we're facing. Amen. It can exist right alongside a bad day, yep. a bad week, or even in the face of bad news. Yep. Praise the Lord. The basic difference between biblical happiness and pleasure is this. The existence of pleasure depends on your immediate circumstance and emotional state. Did you have fun? No, I, was, I didn't feel like going. I didn't really want to go in the first place and blah, 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 blah. See what I'm saying? So... That's the basic difference there between happiness and pleasure is the existence of pleasure depends on your immediate circumstance and emotional condition or state. So whereas with biblical happiness and contentment, it can exist even when your present circumstances are lousy, even when your present circumstances are difficult or iffy and uncertain, when they're challenging, amen, and your natural emotional state is one of volatility. Yeah. It's, you, know, you don't know what it's going to do. You don't know how you're going to respond to, from one situation to the next. Amen. Now, I've said it before, but life is messy. Yeah. Everybody living in any of it. Praise the Lord. Yeah. And God is mysterious. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Again, talking about Blaise Pascal. Uh, several hundred years ago, he wrote this of our inescapable need for God. And I'm going to quote, read this. He wrote this. There was once in a man, excuse me, there was once in man a true happiness of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace. This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him. 
seeking in things that are not the help that he cannot find in things that are. Praise the Lord. Though none can help, since this infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object. In other words, by God himself. Praise the Lord. End of quote. So I know that this, this biblical understanding of happiness can seem like an abstract reality or an abstract thought. Amen. But it ought to be the goal of every believer. Amen. To experience it as a fundamental reality of walking by faith. Yeah. Praise the Lord. The pursuit of happiness. Yeah. Thomas Jefferson knew. They, they argued they wanted to do this. Oh, he was a deist. He was, hey, he believed in God. That's more yeah. than 90% of what's in Washington today. Does. Right. And he had, because of that belief of our founding fathers, hey, they didn't have it all right. We ended up with slavery. We ended up with all kinds of crap that we shouldn't have ever had in the first place because they were not perfect. But they were trying to find the mind of God. They had some preconceived ideas that were bogus, and that caused problems down the road. But the basis for which this country was founded was to be established on our faith in yeah. God. Yeah. And by that, Thomas Jefferson knew that if we did that, we would, that, that would be our pursuit of happiness, would be the focus on God, would bring us that fulfillment, yeah. would bring this not just individually, but collectively as a nation. Praise the Lord. And our want to's away from circumstances. Doesn't mean you don't still want it. You just don't let the circumstance dictate whether or not it is possible. Right. right? You get diagnosed with terminal disease. Amen. Now it's up to you. Am I going to put my focus on the thing that the doctor just said? Or am I going to put my focus on God? I guarantee you, you're not going to be happy if you put your focus on what the doctor told you. No. You're going to be depressed and bummed out and fearful and trying to figure out how am I going to get past this. But if you focus on what God has said, by my stripes you were healed. I'll never leave you or forsake you. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Then even though you may be going through some stuff, you're not letting the stuff dictate the rest of your life. Praise the Lord. I mean, I, if I, if I, I, I don't even want to say it. But if, if something negative like that happened, Look, I don't want, if I've only got six months to live, I don't want to spend that six months depressed and angry at everybody else who's still going to be alive. I want to enjoy that last six months, amen, if that's what it is, or a year, or five years, or whatever it is. I want to experience everything that God has. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So, if, if we do that, if we orient our desires away from what we're looking at, away from the circumstances, and toward the relationship with God, all things are added. Yep. We'll find that this true happiness is so far beyond the sort of happiness that we've been looking for, right. that we thought we wanted, that we thought we needed to give us satisfaction and give us pleasure and so on and so forth. Matthew 17, verses 19 and 20. Matthew 17, 19 through 20. This is... Scripture's always kind of bothered me some, but I understand it maybe a little bit better, at least one aspect of it. He said, then came the disciples of Jesus apart and said, why couldn't we not cast him out? Remember, this is the kid that was having seizures of some kind, and he'd fall in the fire and all this stuff. Yeah. Disciples prayed for him, but it didn't work. And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. Yeah. For verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you'll say unto this mountain, remove hence but yonder, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Nothing shall be impossible right. now what I, we've read it a lot of times in kind of a negative context you know that the disciples couldn't do this and Jesus said if you just believe if you get the focus off of that and onto me you would see that nothing is impossible exactly. praise God if we really consider these I mean outrageous promises of, of reward and the awesome nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels. It seems to me like God finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. That's yeah. what he was saying to the disciples. They were concerned about their image. Why couldn't right. we do this? Right? Yeah. They were looking at the kid, flipping out and doing all the stuff that he was doing, and so on and so forth. And Jesus is saying, look, 
It's just unbelief. Fear. Anxiety. Praise God. A desire for personal aggrandizement, maybe. See, humans, just like the disciples, they're half-hearted creatures. And they fool around with stuff and ambition, which is what this is about. Who's going to be first? Who's going to sit on the right hand? Who's going to sit on the left? I've got more power than Peter does. You know, this guy's got more than him. And uh, why didn't I, why wasn't I able to give me a, uh, you know, a three-step program here that I can figure this thing out? Just ambition. And when infinite joy is being offered to us, he's offering us the thing that everything else in our life that we're trying to do to get, he said, I just want to give it to you. I'm ter- nothing wrong with falling in love and getting married, but I'm saying a lot of people fell in love and got married because they thought that other person was going to make them uh-huh. feel good. Uh-huh. They'd always be, you know, they're going to make me feel good about me and all that kind of stuff. And the trouble is, most of the time, we're both, both parties are a little bit insecure, and so you end up with double the insecurity, not twice of the right. security. Right. <laughs> well, that's why the marriage or the divorce rate is uh, like double what it was 25, 30 years ago, what have you. But... We're too easily pleased yes. with stuff that we really not going to satisfy us yes. in the long run. Amen? Faith isn't destroyed or diminished by doubt. In fact, the opposite is true. Faith is the answer to doubt. It is. When, you're, when you're in the desert and you're dying of thirst, Collapsing in the sand and just saying, well, whatever, yeah. is not going to help you. Exactly. Amen. If you're out in the ocean and you're drowning and you just decide to become motionless, it's not going to save you. No. So why is it when Christians are doubting, they usually think that giving up or shutting down faith is going to provide the answers? It's like, I'm a, I'll show you, Lord. You don't do it for me when I wanted you to do it the way I wanted you to do it. I'm just not going to believe you anymore. I guess you just don't do this for me. Well, you might as well just jump in the ocean and sink like a rock. We get hung up by our doubt, and then we refuse to move until we have an answer. That's not walking by faith. There's always going to be doubt. There's always going to be reasons to question. You know, everywhere in the scripture, God, I've never seen a place where God challenges us uh, in terms of whether doubt should exist or not. He doesn't say you should never doubt. He just says you're not believing enough. Uh Your faith is weak. Amen? It's the one point of unity, believe it or not, between us and God. And that is the recognition that we struggle with faith, belief, and trust. Where we differ from God is that what we think ought to follow, doubt. We think the responsibility rests on God to erase our doubt. But God knows the responsibility rests on us to continue to trust and wait on him even in our doubt. Praise the Lord. Psalms 44, uh, verses 15 through 18. My confusion is continually before me. The shame of my face hath covered me. For the voice of him that reproacheth and blasphemeth by reason of the enemy and avenger. So this is just like us. This is David talking, but he said, you know, I, my confusion, it's always up there. It's always, I, I'm always having to deal with my confusion. I can't seem to get past it. The shame of my failures and weaknesses and so on and so forth has covered me. Because the voice of him, the accuser of the brethren, yeah. that comes to speak into you, yeah to talk to you through your own thinking or through other people or through religion or whatever it might be, reproaches, blasphemes by reason of the enemy and avenger. But look at this, verse 17. All this come upon us, yet have we not forgotten thee, neither have we dealt falsely in thy covenant. Our heart is not turned back, neither have our steps declined from thy way. Praise the Lord. 
See, our programmed response to confusion is doubt, right? While the Psalms teaches us to respond to confusion with faith. We think doubt demands an answer. Amen. And God thinks doubt demands faith. That's why we miss what he's doing a lot of times in our lives. We look at doubt and think it needs immediate, immediate resolution. If there's doubt, I cannot exist with doubt. Doubt's got to be done away with. I got to know. Right? I mean, that's kind of the way we think. God looks at doubt and thinks, you need patience and endurance. Yeah. That's what your doubt is showing me. That's what your doubt is showing God. To me, it's saying, I need resolution here. I need an answer. And God's saying, no. What you need is patience. You need to learn to trust me. You need to have confidence. You need to be able to endure some things through faith so that you can get all things that I promised you. Yeah. Amen? Because that's how it works. God will not give it to you simply because you are confused and in doubt. You get it by faith. And that's why he's telling us when you're in confusion, the answer is to believe. Don't doubt, just believe God. When you're in doubt, just continue to have faith in God. It's, there's nothing wrong with having doubt. It's letting the doubt dominate you into submission to get you to a place where you just give up and say, well, I guess it must be the wrong denomination or we're getting the wrong message or we need to do something different or we just need to give up and quit. Praise the Lord. Yes. Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. That's, that is powerful. Amen. And that ought to sustain us when we're going through things that we can't figure out, that, we, that we're confused about, or that we doubt, or we're doubting in a situation. But he said, I'm persuaded. Yes. Nothing. Not life, not death, not angels, not principalities, not powers, not things present, not things to come. Yes. Nothing, not height, not death. Yes. Any other creature yes. right. is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ yes. Jesus. Yes. That's something to be happy about. Praise yes. the Lord. Yes. Amen. The story of our happiness and our faith doesn't end when we doubt. Right. Faith isn't the absence of doubt. It's the remedy to doubt. Praise the Lord. Doubting is only the beginning. It's in our doubt that we begin to find real faith. Yes. Praise the Lord. All right, we're, we're finished here. But here's the deal. Only a faith that has been doubted can be confirmed. Yes. Praise the Lord. Only a life that's been risked can be redeemed. Only a God who's been trusted can prove himself trustworthy. Yeah. Only true faith can produce true happiness. That's why faith is such a, such a high priority in the scripture. Because why? Because God wants us to have life and have it more abundantly. He wants us to enjoy every part of life. He wants us to be happy. He wants us to be the role model for happiness in this earth. So people can look at you and go... I don't know. I know they've been through some stuff, but they sure seem happy. They sure yes. seem to be everything's good. Yes. Why? Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Because yes. God is going to come through on our behalf. Amen. Yes. I've got nothing to be sad about. Right. Amen. If he's for me, and who can be against me? Yes. Praise the Lord. Right. Only true faith can produce true happiness. So let's live by faith. Yeah. And we'll live happy lives. Yeah. And we'll be a revelation of the glory of God in this earth. Amen. Yeah. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. Amen, amen. God bless you. Thank you for your patience. Don't worry. I got this cow sitting on my shelf, on a bookshelf in the, at home. Don't worry. Don't worry. Be happy. <laughs> Don't worry. Be happy. Hey, just a little Bob Marley and do you go, a world of good, amen? Don't worry. Be happy. That's a, that's a, that could be in the Bible somewhere. We might want to look that up, amen? God bless you. Just be happy in the Lord, amen? Enjoy the strength of the Lord. Your joy is the strength of the Lord. Praise God. Thank you, brother. Now I'm ready.
Walk like an Egyptian too when you're doing it. God bless y'all.